Hi again, everybody. <clears throat> this will be the fourth lecture uh, in our course uh, on history and principles of literary criticism. <clears throat> I'm going to be continuing today to talk about Plato's <clears throat> brief dialogue, The Ion, uh, and I anticipate one more lecture after this one also on The Ion, and we'll also probably dis be discussing this work again, mostly in tutorial this week, before we move on to Plato's Republic <coughs> uh, next week, for Republic Book 10. Um, <coughs> let's uh, get started today just by kind of reviewing, um, even just noticing uh, where we are um, in this course <coughs> in terms of our work uh, with uh, the ION. We do find ourselves <coughs> willy-nilly, that is whether we like it or not, uh, on the territory of epistemology, in other words, theory of knowledge, a very important area of philosophy, but we are not trying really to um, have a discussion uh, within philosophy or about philosophy itself. We, <coughs> we can't get drawn away into a really thoroughgoing discussion <coughs> of epistemology. <coughs> we just need to notice that that <coughs> That's the territory we're on um, with Plato's Ion. What we need to do, of course, uh, is try to take the view of literature and literary criticism from that epistemological perspective. That's the perspective that Plato Socrates uh, argues. <coughs> uh, and as we were discussing <coughs> in tutorial, <coughs> in the last uh, tutorial, Socrates is bringing to this dialogue um, <coughs> his set of assumptions about what knowledge fundamentally is, what it is to know something. Um, <coughs> uh, and, and for Socrates, as we were saying, knowledge uh, is a kind of mastery. It, it is a rational mastery uh, generating a kind of capability <coughs> which Socrates will call, <coughs> in a very general way, <coughs> He'll call this capability, this rational mastery, an art. Again, this is <coughs> a term that is to be understood very, very broadly in, in Plato. <coughs> it, it means any kind of skill, any kind of expertise. Um, <coughs> knowledge uh, is rational uh, by definition for Socrates. And of course, that's not a kind of um, strange idea uh, in any way. <coughs> knowledge uh, is rational. <coughs> it comes down to knowing that things are or are not so. That's what knowledge is from <coughs> Socrates' <coughs> default perspective. And we can summarize a lot of that <coughs> slightly wordy epistemological talk uh, just by noting very simply, very straightforwardly, for Socrates, Pla Plato's Socrates, knowledge by definition is knowing facts, okay? Simple as that. And again, there's, I think, <coughs> nothing strange or exotic <coughs> or <coughs> excuse me or challenging at all about that basic <coughs> socratic conception of what knowledge is and it's from that basis <coughs> that epistemological <coughs> uh, perspective that socrates as we know is challenging ion the rhapsode <coughs> uh, the professional interpreter slash reciter of homer socrates is challenging him <coughs> about the nature of his profession uh, and the nature of his expertise. He is demanding to understand from Ion <coughs> what exactly the rhapsode as such knows about. He's asking Ion, in what are you expert? And to introduce, a, I think, a useful term <coughs> that I used uh, previously, uh, Socrates is asking Ion, in effect, what is your subject matter? In other, in other words, what's your topic? What's your thing? What do you know about? <coughs> what are you, as a rhapsode, properly, if not uniquely, expert in? Ion, of course, wants to give the answer and does give the answer. <coughs> well, I'm an expert in Homer. Nobody understands Homer as well uh, as I do. Uh, Socrates very easily takes that position apart 
utilizing this little kind of comparative method that we were talking about uh, in the last lecture. Uh, so Socrates says, okay, I, I, I get, Ion, that you're telling me you're a big Homer expert. <coughs> what about other poets? Socrates mentions two other ancient Greek poets, Hesiod and Archilochus. <coughs> what about other poets? Are, 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 you <coughs> are, you an, are, are you a Hesiod expert too, uh, for example? <coughs> Ion says, well, no, not really. I'm really all about the Homer. Uh, Socrates says, yeah, okay, but what if, <coughs> and we're on, I'm, I'm reviewing now stuff that we talked about last time, okay? Socrates says, what if, what if Homer and Hesiod agree about something? What if, they, what if they say the same stuff uh, in a given case? In that case, Ion says, yeah, I guess I would have to say I would understand them equally well if Hesiod is saying the same thing as Homer. Socrates presses the issue then, turns it around, says, okay, what if they, what if they disagree? <coughs> Homer and Hesiod have a different take on the subject matter. Ion says, well, no, in that case, I, w I would only be able to interpret the Homer, not the Hesiod. <coughs> uh, what Socrates is showing, uh, as we said last time, uh, is that, again, expertise comes down to the subject matter. Uh, so for Ion to claim that he is an expert at Homer, well, what does that mean? If you understand Homer, if you understand any given text, what that precisely means is that you understand what that text is about, right? Uh, <coughs> knowing the text, being expert in the text, is precisely being expert in its subject matter. But a paradox arises there because the subject matter is not the text. Uh, <coughs> the subject matter is not proper to the text, not unique to the text, doesn't depend on the text. Rather, uh, the subject matter, whatever it may be, is some aspect of the world. <coughs> the text is about that subject matter, but the subject matter is not the text. That's the difficulty. Uh, and let's take an example just to, to try to make sure that this point uh, which, by the way, I, I, I take this point to be in one way an, an extremely ordinary point. I, in another way, I take it to be an extremely strange and difficult point. So let's, <coughs> let's pause uh, over it a little more via an example. Uh, the example, <coughs> let's say, of hospitality, how to treat a guest. And I, 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 I mentioned that example um, mostly because it's a very, very important topic in Homer, <coughs> as we saw even from my reading of Odyssey 19 last time, how to treat a guest, the laws of hospitality, that's something that Homer talks a lot about and actually cares uh, a lot about. <coughs> um, so hospitality, that's a, that's, a, that's a topic, that's a question, that's a subject matter. Uh, Ion, uh, the rhapsode of Homer, will be able to interpret hospitality uh, in this uh, broad sense. He'll be able to bring it out perform it, help you understand what Homer says about hospitality. But of course, hospitality doesn't depend on Homer. Uh, hospitality is out there. It's something that exists uh, in the Greek social world. Ion may say that he understands hospitality via Homer, but the paradox or the kind of slippery slope is that means Ion's understanding of hospitality takes him beyond Homer, outside Homer. You see what I mean? His expertise necessarily is grounded in the subject matter, <coughs> and yet he's supposedly an expert in the text. Uh, and that means for Socrates that any expertise Ion can claim to have is actually only false or inauthentic or secondary, let's say. <coughs> the real expert at hospitality, after all, won't be the rhapsode. It won't even be the poet who is a real subject matter expert in that way. Rather, the expert uh, uh, at hospitality, the one who really knows about it, will be the good host, the person in the Greek world who practices and deploys and evaluates hospitality as a skill, as an art, as a capability, as a knowledge. <coughs> and this is uh, an argument that uh, Plato Socrates develops, as we have seen, <coughs> with regard to skill after skill, profession after profession, 
uh, of the ancient Greek world with regard to carpentry, with regard to medicine, with regard to chariot racing, uh, and so on. <coughs> Just because Ion talks via Homer about chariot racing or whatever does not mean he has any real knowledge, any real expertise in that subject matter. <clears throat> and when we ask, okay, what does Ion fundamentally know then? What, what, what is knowing Homer or understanding Homer? <clears throat> the answer Plato Socrates gives, very uncompromisingly actually, the answer Plato Socrates gives is, well, it's nothing. Knowing Homer is not really knowing anything at all because there doesn't seem to be any subject matter at which the poet <coughs> or the rhapsode <coughs> uniquely or by definition is the expert. <coughs> and um, <coughs> we can perhaps provide a final clarification to uh, this point just by, by jumping ahead a bit to uh, the argument uh, that we will see in, in Plato's Republic, Book 10, <coughs> next week and subsequently, uh, what Plato's Socrates is going to argue there is, <coughs> and again, the argument in one way is very simple, in another way, I think it is very, very mysterious and profound. Uh, Plato's Socrates is going to argue, <coughs> look, <coughs> Homer, <coughs> or any poet, or any artist of any kind, is fundamentally just representing the world, right? giving you a copy or a picture <coughs> of the world uh, in his or her art, whatever the medium may be, in paint, in words, whatever. But if the artist is representing the world, then clearly if you want to know the world, you're going to go to the world and not to the artistic representation. Um, that, I think, is what we find really at the kind of... Um, foundations of uh, Socrates' whole critique, uh, both in the Republic and here in the Ion. Now, coming back to the Ion specifically, there is another issue here, as it were a side issue, but a very, very interesting one and difficult one, which we touched on <coughs> in tutorial this past week. Um, it's the way in which uh, Socrates in this dialogue has chosen so to speak, his target or his opponent. He's not attacking the poet exactly. He's attacking the rhapsode, who is this strange intermediary figure, right? Uh, a, 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 a transmission figure, as it were, <coughs> between uh, the Homeric text and the audience who listens to him perform it. Um, <coughs> uh, and I, I think we had some really, really, uh, actually terrific insights into this particular issue in tutorial. <coughs> I want to come back to that, actually, <coughs> later in the next lecture, and then also in this week's tutorial. So I want to leave that aside for now. I'm simply, uh, as it were, um, <coughs> putting a pin uh, in that issue and leaving it on the board. We'll come back to that whole question of the focus on, on, on the rhapsode. For now, let's develop uh, the main line of the argument, so to speak, which really <coughs> consists in Socrates' claim that there isn't any knowledge in literature. That's, that's the argument that he is driving forward uh, <coughs> fundamentally. Um, <coughs> as I was saying in the last lecture, you know, Socrates, <coughs> he comes on very friendly. Um, <coughs> he's not really your friend. Uh, he's certainly not uh, Ion's friend. <coughs> uh, he is quite a dangerous person. So... <coughs> I'm just going to kind of re-enter into evidence the quotes uh, from our text <coughs> where Socrates makes this point uh, <coughs> uh, very uh, clearly and concisely <coughs> uh, at the bottom of page 6 um, where Ion is demanding to know from Socrates, okay, why do I, why do I fall asleep uh, when other poets <laughs> are recited, but when Homer is there, wow, I, I wake up and I'm, I'm all ears. <coughs> Socrates says, the reason my friend is obvious no one, <coughs> no one can fail to see that you speak of Homer without any art or knowledge. Uh, if you were able to speak of him by rules of art, you would have been able to speak of all other poets. And at the bottom of uh, page 7, <coughs> and now we are um, breaking some new ground I in our <coughs> investigation of this text. <coughs> at the bottom of page 7, Socrates advances his theory <coughs> of how Ion is actually 
able to do <coughs> what he does. <coughs> he says, uh, again, bottom of page 7 in our PDF, Socrates says to Ion, the gift which you possess of speaking excellently about Homer is not an art, but, as I was just saying, an inspiration. There is a divinity moving in you like that contained uh, in the stone which Euripides calls a magnet. <coughs> I'm going to pause there. Uh, this is the Socratic theory of, of how art works, uh, of how poetry works, of, of how, uh, how the rhapsode is able to do what he does. It's nothing to do with knowledge in a, in a rational, uh, worldly, fact-directed sense. Rather, for Plato's Socrates, <coughs> the rhapsode's capability is, as it were, uh, a purely passive and a purely negative capability. The rhapsode is really good at getting uh, inspired, <coughs> or perhaps we could even say possessed um <coughs> uh, by a divinity, uh, as, as Socrates says, a god, uh, in other words. The rhapsode does what he does when he is divinely possessed or inspired. Uh, now, it's, it's going to be relevant here, and, and, and it's just also, I think, a very interesting uh, bit uh, of cultural history. <coughs> it's going to be relevant here that when we're looking at the society of classical At <coughs> Athens, <coughs> we are probably looking at people who, for the most part, <coughs> maintain a literal belief in the beings they refer to as the gods. <coughs> so they really think those gods are, are, are real and they are out there. Um, we need to keep in mind, perhaps, that when the Greeks talked about the gods, <coughs> they, they didn't really mean <coughs> those anthropomorphized <coughs> beings <coughs> um, who are imagined to live in some kind of palace on Olympus. Not really. Uh, when they talked about the gods, they really, they, they meant natural forces and natural phenomena. That, that, that was the nature of, of the ancient Greek and Roman paganism. It's a religion, a worship of the powers of the world, okay? So, uh, rivers, trees, war, love, wheat, wine, these are all gods. Uh, and there are gods of, of, uh, of creative inspiration. Uh, in uh, the ancient Greek pantheon, pantheon they're, called, they're called the Muses. <coughs> um, the theory, the model that Socrates is advancing is one in which a, in which, uh, uh, creative work, like poetry, <coughs> is a direct result of inspiration or possession by a divinity, and this is an inspiration or possession that takes the character of an irrationality, okay? A madness, uh, in other words. The poet, the rhapsode, they do not know what they are doing. Even the spectators of a rhapsodic performance, they don't know what they are doing. They have all been taken over by this divine madness in which creativity consists for Plato's Socrates. And I want to advance uh, a, 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 a term, a, a vocabulary term, uh, which is not uh, Greek. It comes along later. It's a Latin term, but it, it's, I think, a very useful one for designating uh, this very, very influential Platonic idea, because that is what we are learning about uh, right now. Uh, certainly one of the most influential ideas uh, in the history of the Western world, the idea of this uh, creative madness out of which poetry or other art comes. The word I want to introduce and, and be able to use as we go forward is, is, is furor uh, in Latin, F-U-R-O-R, furor. It's cognate with our term fury. Uh, and <coughs> that's a term that, that designates this, this divinely inspired creative madness in uh, the Platonic tradition. Um, <coughs> it, it, it is something that just happens to a poet. Uh, it's something that just happens to the rhapsode. He has no control over it. Uh, and and that's, that's, that's the theory of Plato's Socrates. What, what, what Ion knows is nothing. Even what Ion does, in a sense, is nothing. Something is done to him uh, when this furor, uh, this this divine inspiration slash possession slash madness takes him over. 
Uh, this is an idea, as I said, with a very, very long legacy. And I added a couple of handouts to the Canvas page uh, to help us get a sense of the legacy and the implications of uh, that platonic ideal. <coughs> that is something, again, that I would like us to talk about in tutorial uh, this week. Um, in any case, uh, Socrates uh, gives a very long account of this theory of uh, divine uh, possession that he is advancing for the nature of creative work. Uh, he, he, he glosses it or explains it <coughs> uh, with the help of a metaphor, uh, or I guess we should say a simile uh, more uh, accurately. The simile is to the power of the magnet. Now this is uh, quite cool, I think, uh, because uh, in antiquity, and actually right up until the 17th century, magnets uh, were not only not understood, no, nobody knew how magnets worked, <coughs> you know, this strange bit of metal, uh, or, or rather this strange kind of stone which has the power to draw uh, ferrous metals to it as though by magic. This was very, very mysterious uh, to the ancient world. And in fact, there was a well-developed view, <coughs> not only that, you, that, that nobody really understood magnetism, but also there was a well-developed view in antiquity uh, that it actually was impossible to understand magnetism. Nobody would ever be able to make any sense of it. That was a, <coughs> a very well-developed assumption, as I've said. Um, so uh, Socrates develops this, this elaborate metaphor uh, from, uh, from page 8 down to around page 10 in our PDF of, uh, of uh, the muses, <coughs> these divine or semi-divine beings who have, who have <coughs> power over uh, artistic expression. Uh, Socrates develops this elaborate picture in which the muses are, are exercising uh, magnetic force uh, through various poets. Um, and <coughs> so You've got, let's say, one muse who exercised that force over Homer. So Homer is magnetized uh, in a certain special way by the muse. Uh, it so happens, this is Socrates' theory, it so happens that for reasons we can't really understand, some people, like you, Ion, happen to respond very powerfully to Homer's particular magnetic charge. And so you dangle. Uh, this is the image. You dangle Ion from the Homeric magnet, and the spectators, the audience of Ion's performance, then dangle uh, from him. <coughs> but other poets in, in Socrates' metaphor, other poets have kind of a different magnetic charge. Uh, so you've got, you've got a, a muse dangling Hesiod, and from Hesiod dangle people who uh, really dig Hesiod. You've got another muse dangling Homer and from Homer dangle uh, Ion uh, and uh, <laughs> his uh, spectators. Um, it is kind of a perfect metaphor, I guess, for the pure irrationality uh, that Socrates is arguing for uh, as uh, the only way uh, in which we can understand what the rhapsode actually does. Um, um, uh, and uh, Socrates' metaphor of the magnet, the chain of, of magnetisms, uh, comes to a conclusion on page 10 in our PDF. <coughs> I'm going to read a little bit of this, uh, where Socrates is saying to Ion, Do you know that the spectator is the last of the rings, which, as I'm saying, receive the power of the original magnet from one another? The rhapsode, like yourself, and the actor are intermediate links, and the poet himself is the first of them. Through all these, the god sways the souls of men in any direction which he pleases, and makes one man hang down from another. Thus there is a vast chain of dancers and masters and undermasters of choruses who are suspended as if from the stone at the side of the rings which hang down from the muse. And every poet has some muse from whom he is suspended and by whom he is said to be possessed, which is nearly the same thing, for he is taken hold of. And from these first rings, which are the poets, depend others, some deriving their inspiration from Orpheus, 
others from Musaeus, but the greater number are possessed and held by Homer, of whom, Ion, you are one, and are possessed by Homer. <clears throat> and when anyone who repeats the words of another poet, you go to sleep and know not what to say. But when anyone recites a strain of Homer, you wake up in a moment, and your soul leaps within you, and you have plenty to say. For not by art or knowledge about Homer do you say what you say, but by divine inspiration and by possession. Uh, the, as it were, triumphant conclusion of Socrates' argument about um, literature, so to speak, as a knowledge-free space, nothing to do uh, with the actual mastery of, of worldly subject matters in which a real knowledge or real skill uh, always and by definition, according to Socrates, uh, consists. Now, I said uh, uh, just a second ago that, that we've come kind of the, to the conclusion of Socrates' argument, and we have. <coughs> and yet, very wonderfully, we have not come to the conclusion of the dialogue, uh, not by a long shot. Again, we were having a nice discussion in Tutoro this week about, about what the implications are uh, for Plato's choosing dialogues as the uh, form uh, in which to advance his philosophy. I, I would like to come back to that again uh, in Tutorial this week and probably also uh, in subsequent weeks. <coughs> what we can say for the moment is, is that when we're reading a, a, a text like the Ion, obviously we're reading a dialogue which is canned which is fake. Uh, it's, a, it's a representation of a dialogue, uh, if you like. That means, among other things, that Plato can do whatever he wants uh, with these dialogues. Uh, he can certainly have Socrates winning every point, and sometimes it does seem that way uh, in Plato, uh, <coughs> where Socrates' interlocutors, the people he's talking to, they're just always kind of going, yes, Socrates, it is so, Socrates, you are right, Socrates, uh, you have put it very well, Socrates, stuff like that. Um, or Plato can choose to show a dialogue not quite going that way. And the Ion is, I think, a very, very interesting case of a dialogue that actually does not quite go Socrates' way. Um, <coughs> Uh, you know, Socrates, he's obviously much smarter than Ion. He's the commanding figure of this conversation. He's leading it exactly where he wants it to go. And he effortlessly, Socrates effortlessly, gets Ion to agree, basically, uh, with Socrates' argument that he, uh, the rhapsode, really doesn't know anything. To some extent, Ion even seems to think this is kind of cool, you know? Yeah, divine inspiration. Okay, I'll go with that. But <laughs> only up to a point. Uh, and I think in a, in a kind of an ironic and, a, and I think painful but wonderful way, <clears throat> we begin to recognize what kind of conversation we are reading, this conversation between uh, Socrates and Ion. It is the conversation in which uh, the winner can't win. Um, to put that very kind of crudely. Um, uh, and let me, let me go back to the text, and, and what I'm trying to say I think will come out more clearly um, that way. So I'm still on page 10 of our uh, PDF. <coughs> Socrates, as it were, has just, again, triumphantly concluded his, his, his argument about inspiration and all those chains of inspired people hanging from the <laughs> magnets of the muses. <coughs> Socrates says, that is good, Socrates. Excuse me, Ion says. Ion says. Ion says, that is good, Socrates, and yet I doubt whether you will ever have eloquence enough to persuade me that I praise Homer only when I am mad and possessed. And if you could hear me speak of him, I am sure you would never think this to be the case. <clears throat> Do you see what uh, has happened there at that moment uh, of the conversation? Socrates, as it were, has won the argument. He has enforced his view. Boom! Ion says, yeah, yeah, but no. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense, Socrates. Hmm. Yeah, I don't buy it. Nope. Uh, he nullifies, Ion does. Um, and uh, it is, as I'm trying to say, I think it is a wonderfully ironic moment 
uh, in the way this dialogue works is represented to us as a dialogue, as uh, a conversation. <coughs> Again, something to come back to more fully, I think, in tutorial. Um, you know, you can win an argument, let's say, but you cannot actually force your interlocutor to concede defeat, right? Uh, <coughs> uh, Socrates has won. Ion agrees that Socrates has won. And then in one of those terribly frustrating moments that happen to us all sometimes in conversation, <coughs> the person to whom you have just proved your point just kind of uh, goes all the way back to his or her opening position, just like, uh, <coughs> you know, uh, jumping down a great big long snake on a board of snakes and ladders <laughs> going from uh, the end uh, all the way back to the beginning. <coughs> and um, that's, that's, it's ironic, it's kind of funny. Socrates starts to get quite frustrated. And from this point on, as I'm going to try to explain, the dialogue doesn't go very well uh, for Socrates. But just before we do that, let's pause a little bit um, on this point about um, what happens to the dialogue as a dialogue uh, at this point. As I've said, <coughs> there's a number, I think, of, of dialogic uh, insights that, <coughs> that uh, are, are latent or imminent or available uh, in this moment of Plato's Ion. One of them, as I've said, it, it has to do with the concept of winning uh, an argument. <coughs> you can win an argument, I suppose, but you can't actually enforce your victory. Uh, you can't force your opponent to concede defeat. That has to come from, uh, from him or her. <coughs> and um, a couple of other uh, points toggled to uh, that one. <coughs> Socrates' whole argument in the Ion, as we know by now, uh, is that Ion knows nothing. He understands nothing fully. He is master, as it were, of no <laughs> fact. <coughs> but, <coughs> excuse me, in order to make that point to Ion, <coughs> Socrates needs him, needs Ion, to master exactly that one fact, right? There's a paradox, even a contradiction there, uh, in the very notion of explaining to somebody else that they know nothing. Because in, for, for them to get that point, they have to know at least one thing. They have to know that they know nothing. So the the uh, the argument is is self contradictory uh, in uh, that way, <coughs> um, and if we wanted to, we could probably even push uh, these kinds of considerations a little further, a little more into purely theoretical territory. Is there even any sense to the notion of knowing nothing? Can we know that we know nothing? That may actually be uh, kind of an unstable idea. And finally, and just before we move on back to the text, as some of you guys may be aware uh, from previous courses or readings, um, <coughs> uh, Soc the whole kind of claim of Plato's Socrates himself is always presented to us <coughs> in Plato as a kind of intellectually uh, paradoxical one. Uh, Socrates never claims to know a bunch of stuff. Uh, exactly to the contrary. Plato Socrates is always meeting people who claim to know stuff. <laughs> and then Socrates, through his questioning, he, he, he makes it apparent that the people he's talking to don't actually know what they think they know. What does Plato's Socrates claim himself to know? Well, you guys, he always claims to know nothing. Uh, if then it even makes sense that Ion knows nothing, Ion and Socrates would start to look like mirror images of each other. And that cannot be, uh, as it were, a successful result, I think, for Socrates' attempt to demonstrate that the rhapsode is kind of a waste of space. Okay. Uh, Let's, um, let, let's put a ribbon around some of that stuff just by saying there's something, there's something paradoxical and slippery and weird and possibly contradictory uh, in, in Socrates' attempt to
to force Ion to know that he knows nothing. Let's, let's leave that at that for now, uh, and uh, we'll go on uh, uh, looking at how this dialogue uh, wraps up. Um <coughs> Socrates has proven uh, that Ion uh, knows nothing. He's merely a recipient of divine inspiration, or furor. Ion accepts this, but also doesn't accept it. He agrees with the argument, but he also nullifies the argument. And accordingly, what happens then uh, in the final pages of our PDF is that we get a whole kind of repetition of the argument. Uh, as Socrates tries to win again, tries to prove his point again, he goes into a whole new set of examples, of skills, uh, expertises in subject matter that exist in the ancient Greek world, uh, peppering the argument this time around with, with extensive quotations from Homer, uh, interestingly. Uh, and uh, he, he, he tries to, <coughs> you know, as, as I said, run the race again, get to the finish line again, prove all over again what he already proved uh, that Ion uh, doesn't <coughs> know anything. Um, and uh, again, I hope that the kind of conversation this one starts to turn into is at least a little bit familiar to us. We've all had these kinds of conversations where you win your point, the person you just defeated <coughs> refuses to accept that you won the point, so you have to go round and round and round, and it makes you crazy <coughs> and is very frustrating because if winning didn't work the first time, you guys, <laughs> why do we think that winning again will do what winning didn't do the first time around uh, in uh, the conversation. <coughs> and I hope you would agree with my lived uh, experience that uh, conversations of this kind do not get better. Uh, they only get worse and worse and worse. This conversation certainly gets worse uh, for uh, Socrates. Uh, and I'm going to turn now to page 13 uh, in our uh, PDF. Having, as I've said, having gone through the whole argument again, uh, example after example of, uh, of worldly expertise that the rhapsode does not have, <coughs> uh, by the bottom of page 13 in our PDF, Socrates kind of drags the argument back to the finish line again, <coughs> um, saying to Ion, <coughs> Then upon your own showing, the rhapsode and the art of the rhapsode will not know everything. Ion says, <coughs> I should exclude certain things, Socrates. Socrates says, you mean to say that you would exclude pretty much the subjects of all other arts. As he does not know all of them, which of them will he know? So this is Socrates again. Aha, I've got you again. Back at the finish line. I'm winning again. <coughs> uh, but not so. Because very remarkably, and I think quite wonderfully, Ion actually has an answer this time around for Socrates' challenging, aggressive, hostile question. What the heck do you even know? What does the rhapsode even know about? Ion, answer me that! <laughs> Socrates is demanding, and Ion, remarkably, this time does answer at the bottom of page 13. He says he, the, the rhapsode, he will know what a man and what a woman ought to say, and what a free man and what a slave ought to say, and what a ruler and what a subject. That's the subject matter, <laughs> Ion says, that the rhapsode actually has. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, the... The answer that Ion gives there, let's say it's a little bit eclectic, it's a bit vague, a bit obscure, <coughs> and I would like to come back in tutorial uh, to try to have a, a, a more full discussion <coughs> of what he's actually talking about. But I think we can, <coughs> we can say <coughs> vaguely, uh <coughs> but with some confidence, <coughs> that Ion I is asserting <coughs> that, <coughs> that the rhapsode has some kind of expertise in matters having to do with conduct, <coughs> correct social conduct, and having to do with power, and having to do with morals. So it's a, in a, in a, in a broad and somewhat vague, but nonetheless evident way, he's making a claim about the territory of, of ethics uh, as one in which the rhapsode will have 
expertise, precisely as a rhapsode. Whether or not that claim makes any sense to us, uh, that appears to be the claim that Ion is advancing. And again, that is an actual subject matter, uh, which he is claiming as his own uh, and that of other rhapsodes by virtue of their profession. Socrates, um, again, uh, <coughs> goes into another little uh, mini rehearsal or repetition of the argument he's been developing all the way through the dialogue. Um, you know, so Ion says, well, the, the, the rhapsode will know what different kinds of people ought to say and how they ought to behave. Uh, Socrates, you know, immediately and frustratedly starts to say, well, do you mean that, uh, that the rhapsode will know uh, how to spin wool the way a, the way a, a spinning woman does? I says, no. Uh, do you mean that the rhapsode will know how to be a cow herd? Will he be really good at herding the cows? Uh, uh, Ion says no. Uh, and then <coughs> uh, Socrates, uh, again, as it were, sensing that he's going to win again. Uh, and I'm now on page 14, uh, middle of page 14 in our PDF, where Socrates says triumphantly, ironically, uh, Socrates says to Ion, at any rate, he will know, the, the rhapsode, at any rate, he will know what a general ought to say when exhorting his soldiers. Uh, this question that Socrates throws at Ion, clearly meaning it as a kind of as-if question. So what are you telling me, Ion? <laughs> you you telling me a rhapsode is going to know how to be a general? Is that, like, is that what you mean? <laughs> and Ion, amazingly and wonderfully, answers, yes, that's what I mean, Socrates. Uh, uh, Ion answers to Socrates' question about generalship. Um, Ion says, yes, that is the sort of thing which the rhapsode will be sure to know. Socrates asks incredulously, <laughs> well, but is the art of the rhapsode the art of the general? Ion says, I am sure that I should know what a general ought to say. Um, it's amazing, uh, anticlimactic and frustrating and almost absurd, and yet for all that, I think very uh, tantalizing and wonderful uh, conclusion to the dialogue because Ion has just taken up this, this incredibly strong position which seems to make no sense at all on its face, that a rhapsode is the same, being a rhapsode is basically the same as being a general. And a, and a rhapsode knows what a general knows and has the knowledge that a, that a, that a general has. <coughs> Socrates, of course, immediately says, okay, well, if that's true, Ion, why don't you go be a general? You know, we always need good generals. Go on, <laughs> get, get an army and, and start defending us. If, if that's what you're good at. And Ion has this very lame kind of weaselly answer. He says, yeah, well, I would do that, Socrates, except I'm from Ephesus. Uh, and you know, in Ephesus, we just, we just don't do that. It's not our thing. So, uh, but if I weren't from Ephesus, yeah, for sure, I, I, I could totally go be a general. That's where Ion's uh, position uh, comes out. Um, and, um, uh, again, it's a it, it, it's a it's an anticlimax to the dialogue. Um, Socrates is totally incredulous at this absurd claim, seemingly absurd claim, uh, that Ion has made, and yet, and this then becomes something immensely strange and worth uh, asking some questions about. Ion really seems to think this claim he has advanced makes sense, and he will not move off, off that claim. He will not give up on it, uh, uh, on his claim that the art of the rhapsode in the last analysis is the same as the art of the general, the military officer. And this is a claim that Ion seems to be tying back to his earlier uh, and much broader, much vaguer point that the rhapsode will know what a man and a woman ought to say and what a slave and what a master and so on. So we have uh, some slippery fish, as it were, uh, in that basket to try to make sense of uh, in tutorial 
uh, this week. And um, uh, on that, I'm going to wrap uh, this lecture up. Uh, one concluding <coughs> point, or rather one concluding, uh, excuse me, rem reminder about an issue that I would like us to think about some more and discuss some more. Uh, it has to do with that Platonic notion of, of furor, or divine inspiration or possession. Uh, as I said, I, I added a couple of handouts to the Canvas page that are relevant to the legacy of this Platonic idea, because it is a, it is a Platonic idea with a very, very long legacy, one that is, I would say, still with us, as a matter of fact, the idea that artistic creativity is radically remote from anything that we would call knowledge, but rather involves some other um, <coughs> mental power, psychic power, you could say, power of the soul, to put it in ancient Greek terms, uh, which we can only understand as a kind of possession uh, by a divine power. Um, <coughs> Uh, and and to, to be perfectly clear, I'm, I'm absolutely not, as it were, uh, advocating for that idea. Uh, I'm indicating that as an idea that uh, will reward further critical thinking, uh, let's say. The two handouts that I added to the Canvas page are, first of all, uh, the, the famous exchange uh, between Theseus and Hippolyta uh, in Act 5, Scene 1 of Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. Some of you guys will already be familiar with that, others perhaps not. The second text <laughs> that I added <coughs> is, is a romantic text, Coleridge's famous poem, Kubla Khan. We could, we could add text after text after text after text on this point, but those two, I think, will help us do a lot of work on that point. So I'm simply saying in a very long-winded uh, way, uh, please, if you could have a look at those texts, <coughs> neither of them very long, before tutorial this coming week, that would be great. And with that, let's leave Ion and Socrates um, holding their dialogue of the death uh, in an epistemological tunnel uh, for eternity, okay? But I will see you guys uh, next time. Thank you very much.